Today we're going to look at the third of Newton's laws of motion. It's called the law of action-reaction. The formal statement of the law of action-reaction is usually like about so. If a some object A exerts a force on some object B, then that object B will exert an equal and opposite force on object A. So let's say you push on a wall. Then of course there's going to be a force of U on wall. But there's also got to be a force on you and that's why you don't fall over because there's a force pushing backwards and it's going to be the same size but in the opposite direction. That would be the force of the wall on you. Mathematically, we could write it this way. The force of A on B will be the same size as the force of B on A. These two forces are vectors and their direction will be opposite to one another. So there's Newton's third law written as a concise mathematical statement. An important implication of Newton's third law is that forces always occur in pairs. There are no isolated forces. Wherever you find one, there's got to be a partner. It takes two to tangle. You can't touch without being touched. And if you punch somebody in the head, you might break your hand. So if, say, two blocks come and collide together, then yes, there will be one interaction, but there's two forces. So you have two forces, one on each object. Another implication of Newton's third law is that if you don't have the reaction, you can't have the action. So for instance, let's say we've got a hanging sheet of paper. And over here we've got a heavyweight champion. Let's say it's Mike Tyson. Now Mike Tyson has awesome punching power. And he can exert a force far bigger than 50 Newtons on a punching bag, but he could never do that on a hanging sheet of paper because with a hanging sheet of paper the only force of resistance would be air resistance and the force of air resistance is going to be less than 50 newtons. Remember 50 newtons is like hanging a 5 kilogram mass. Or let's say we've got a totally frictionless ice rink and you're in the center of it and you try to walk. You're not going to be able to go anywhere because you're not going to be able to exert any forces on the rink itself. Your foot is just going to slide and that means that there can't be any forces on you making you go forward. So no force on ice means no force on you. So you can move your legs all you want. You just won't go anywhere. Identifying force pairs is really, really easy. All you really need to do is exchange words. And by the way, which force we call the action force and which force we call the reaction force doesn't really matter. They're symmetrical. So if we say the action force here is the man pulling on the spring, then all we have to do is reverse those two nouns and we'll get the reaction force. So the reaction force would simply be that the spring pulls on the man. So don't stray from this very simple procedure. If your action force is tire pushing on the road, then the reaction will be the road pushing on the tire. And that's going to drive the car forward. Or if we've got a rocket in outer space, it's burning fuel and it's pushing gases out the back of it, then your action force rocket on gas. Reaction would be the gas on the rocket. So there's a force on the rocket driving it forward. 
this last example is really important and in fact this example often comes up on IB exams. So we've got a ball being dropped. The force on it is of course the weight of the ball, the gravitational attraction between the earth and the ball. So the earth is pulling the ball towards it. Let's switch the words around. The ball must be pulling on the earth. So there is an equal and opposite force on the earth pulling the earth up towards the ball. Of course the earth is so massive that force ends up being kind of negligible but it's there nevertheless. If you understood that last example, this IB question is going to be very easy. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So here's our lamp and there's a force on it that's the weight of the lamp. Well the weight is really just the earth pulling the lamp. The reaction force, we've got to interchange those two words. Lamp pulls earth. So there is a force on the earth pulling the earth towards the lamp. So the correct answer here is C. I now have a few conundrums for you. F the first one, we've got a foot kicking a ball. Now by Newton's third law, we've got to get equal and opposite forces. And we know that equal and opposite forces generally cancel out. Therefore there would be no net force and therefore it's impossible to kick a football and make it move. What's wrong with that reasoning. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. What's critical to realize here is that we've got one force on the football. So that's the force of the foot on the ball. And the other force of course is the force of the ball on foot. And it's true, they are equal in size and opposite in direction. Why don't they cancel out? For a very, very simple reason. One force is on the foot. One force is on the football. The football, in terms of its motion, really doesn't care what happens to the foot. It's only interested in the forces that are on it. It feels a forward force, it goes forward. The foot, it really doesn't care that there's forces on the football. It just knows that there's a backwards force on it and that's going to slow down the foot's motion. So the critical idea here is that the action reaction forces do not cancel because they are on different objects. Key phrase there, different objects. Second conundrum you're standing in the center of a totally frictionless ice rink. You can't walk on it because you can't exert any force on the ice, so the ice can't exert any force on you. How could you get off the ice rink? How could you get yourself moving? Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. There's lots of ways of doing this. Probably the simplest would be simply to throw your jacket. If you did that, there'd be a force on the jacket and then there's got to be an equal and opposite force on you. That force is only going to last while you're actually in contact with the jacket. After that you can rely on Newton's first law. Once you get up a little bit of velocity you're going to keep that velocity. There's no forces of friction acting on you so you'll keep going at constant velocity until you get to the edge of the rink. Another conundrum. Let's imagine that we have a very intelligent horse and he is about to pull a cart but he's just learned Newton's third law. Don't worry if you can't draw horses as well as I can. I've been doing it for a long time. And this is what the horse says to himself. He says, well, Newton's third law says that the force of me pulling on the cart will be equal and opposite to the force of the cart pulling on me. In other words, the harder I pull, the harder the cart pulls back. Therefore, there's no point in me even trying to pull the cart because we're not going to move. So he claims by Newton 3 that there's no point to pulling the cart. Is the horse right? Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. 
Well, our horse is partly right. It is certainly true that the force of the horse on the cart will be equal and opposite to the force of the horse on the cart. The thing is, that's really an internal force. So those two forces do cancel out, but they don't affect the motion of the system. We've really got to consider the whole horse cart system. So we've really got to look at external forces. Of course, the important one there would be that force between the ground and the horse. There will be a force of the horse on the ground and there will be a force of the ground on the horse. Those are equal and opposite forces, but one's on the ground, one's on the horse. And similarly, there'd be a force of friction. That would be the friction from the ground onto the cart. And there'd be a force pair there, so that these two forces would be equal and opposite. That would be the force of the cart on the ground. Now, we don't need to concern ourselves with these two forces because they're not on the system. We already eliminated these forces because they're internal. So the important ones become the force of the ground and the horse and the frictional force of the ground and the cart. And as long as that force of the ground on the horse is bigger than the frictional force of the ground on the cart, then the cart is going to move. So our horse, he is pretty smart, but he's not smart enough to outsmart us, and he is going to still have to pull that darn cart. One last little conundrum. You've probably used force scales like this one in the classroom, and typically we hold one end of it and we put a weight on the other end. We let it hang, and if let's say we put a 10 kilogram mass there, we would get a reading here of 100 newtons. Let's suppose we use the scale a little bit differently. We put a 100 newton weight on one side, another 100 newton weight on the other side, and then use pulleys to attach those two weights to either end of our scale. What will the reading on the scale be? Pause the video and try this question now. Well, the answer would, once again, be 100 newtons, because you're not really doing anything different in situation two than situation one. You can't have an action without a reaction. So we've got to have support of 100 newtons in this case, just like we had support on one end here. And then the weight that we're measuring is on the other end, just like we had here. So the two situations really aren't any different and we'd still get a 100 Newton reading. And one last very important IB question. Pause the video, read it over, try it for yourself, come back for the answer. So we're told that there is a force R, which is really the force of the scale on the person. The reaction to that would be a force on the scale. It would be the same size force, but in the opposite direction. I'm going to call it R as well because it has the same magnitude as its reaction pair. So this would be the force of the person on the scale. And of course, it's the force of the person on the scale. That's the force that's squeezing our scale. It's this force here that the scale is measuring. That's the force that's squeezing the scale. And the more it gets squeezed, the bigger the reading on the scale. Which is to say, the correct answer here is C. The reading on the scale will be R. Now, if our elevator was not accelerating upwards, R would be equal to the weight. Because our elevator is accelerating upwards, R will in fact be bigger than the person's weight. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.